Hello and welcome to Wasted Potential, where we discuss the wasted potential of our favourite plotlines. Part 3 of the Netherrealm DLC character series, let's go! For this, rather than a side campaign, I see a series of two fight chapters for the DLC cast that run alongside or after the main story. Where possible, each fight will use a different variation to give players a better taste of their new character. Seriously, I don't think any of Netherrealm's games with any kind of customizability in the movesets have ever done anything halfway decent with them in the story mode. If you're looking you'll get a flashback in the chapter that uses a different variation, but that's it. First, we have Tremor. This takes place after Sonya departs to help the kids against Shinnok, so around the time Chapter 11 is wrapping up. Or if Netherrealm were too lazy to put in a Red Sky variation of the stage being used, then after Chapter 12. Both fights take place at the refugee camp as Tremor arrives with a Black Dragon Force to free Kano from captivity. Kenshi is the first opponent, holding down the fort while the others are away. As he goes down, Jax arrives with Serena and some soldiers, giving us an explanation for where the hell he was while Kenshi brought Quan Chi back to base. Jax tells Serena to help Kenshi while he deals with Tremor. Tremor calls back to NK Special Forces where Jax beat him and almost killed him, forcing his powers to manifest in a more overt way to save his life. He shows this off by fighting in crystalline form. Tremor frees Kano from his cell, but Jax, Kenshi and Serena catch up. Tremor uses a portal stone to flee with Kano, but Jax manages to get a shot off that makes Tremor drop the stone as he flees, giving the SF a minor victory. Next we have Tanya. Being a character who already appeared in the story, her chapter simply continues from where her last scene left off. After her and Rain's defeat in Chapter 6, the two were imprisoned by Kotal. Upon hearing of Melina's execution, the two decide it's best to escape and go into hiding until they can come up with a new plot to kill Kotal. After escaping their cells, they're ambushed by Eren and Ferator. Tanya fights Eren with Kobujutsu. Once the guards are beaten, the two Edenians flee into the jungle, pursued by Kotal's other followers. While hiding, tensions rise between the two and a fight erupts, with Tanya using some artifacts she found to use her pyromancer variation. Fire and water, you see. This artifact could also explain the change in her eyes and possibly skin tone to justify the change in design between story mode and DLC. With Rain beaten, Tanya flees. Rain is captured, his fate unknown, while Tanya escapes to plot her revenge on Kotal. It's similar to her ending, sure, but the ending could be rewritten as a sequel to this chapter where she avenges Melina and frees Adenia from Outworld before setting her sights on a way to resurrect Melina. Third, Borai Cho. As with Tanya, we pick up from his last appearance, in this case, Chapter 10. After being wrecked by Shinnok, Bo is quickly forgotten about as Shinnok and his revenants all focus their attention on Raiden. This allows Bo to recover beneath her notice. While recovering, he flashes back to shortly before the tournament. We see his relationship with the two monks as he spars with Liu Kang and Bartitsu. After the match, he tells them he's proud of them both, but Lao shows clear discontentment with not being able to compete. Bo assures him that his time will come. This can be seen as Bo unwittingly fueling Lao's ego, eventually leading to his death. Back in the present, once he's healed by whatever's in his flask, Bo attempts to escape, but is found by the monks. After some antagonistic banter, in contrast with the mutual respect shown in the flashback, Bo takes a swig from his flask and fights the two with drunken fist. He's able to blind Kang with his booze and launch him through the hole in the wall that Shinnok made with Bo's body, but we never saw again. Then, Lao sardonically asks if this is his moment to gain glory by killing the master even Liu Kang couldn't best. Seeing how far gone the revenants are, Bo reluctantly takes his drunken master's stance. Once Lao goes down, Kang returns with Striker, Nightwolf and Cabal. He sends the trio after Bo, who flees the temple with the three in hot pursuit, hoping to one day find a way to restore his former pupils. This also explains those three revenants absence during the climax. Next we have Triborg. Triborg is activated by Frost, who broke into the hidden vault of the now destroyed cyber factory where he was stored. This location is represented by the SF training room. After being brought up to speed on what Sub-Zero's done to the Lin Kuei, he requests a sparring match with Frost to test his capabilities. She agrees, knowing he'll be able to kill Sub-Zero once he's fully operational. This works to set up her interest in cybernetics for MK11. If the devs would be willing to program a moveset for Frost, even if it's just Sub-Zero's or Sindel's with Sub-Zero's specials, that's the first fight. If not, we have a flashback to his creation at the Hand of Sector. Sector spars with him to test his capabilities, but he proves incomplete. Sector is forced to put him back into storage as Sub-Zero attacks the factory. In the present, Triborg is ready, so he and Frost ambush Sub-Zero as he returns from the fight with Kotal's forces. Thanks to his weakened state, Sub-Zero loses, but Hanzo arrives intending to discuss the two's alliance. Triborg is badly damaged by the duo and is forced to flee with Frost. Hanzo promises to help Sub-Zero track them down and end the old Lin Kuei's machinations for good. This could then alter MK11 so that Cyrax is not brought back just to die again. Triborg replaces both him and Sector, perhaps even being fought twice in that chapter with different capabilities. Now we come to the four guests. As with Freddy last time, these characters play out sequels and reboots featuring Johnny or Cassie during her brief acting career in her teens. 
If the stories released together, these are part of a larger segment, movie night at the cage house. Johnny and Cassie are watching some movies, possibly featuring a younger Cassie and advancing through time with each film as she goes from child who really shouldn't be allowed to watch this, to disinterested teen, to young adult who just loves spending time with her dad. That last one can be set prior to chapter 2 or after the story while Johnny's recovering from his torture, or both if we have four films. For this presentation, we'll have two films. Let's start with Alien vs Predator. Since Netherrealm still insists on not giving its guests their own stages after Kratos, we'll use existing stages as stand-ins. The plot sees Johnny Cage star as himself, pursuing an alien craft detected over Shang Tsung's island. A group of Predators land on the island and are ambushed by a new breed of Xenomorph at the pit. Our lead Yaucha, the Hish Q10, kills an acidic Xeno. They venture deeper into the island to Shang Tsung's lab, where they're ambushed again. This time, the maskless warrior is killed by the Conjurer Praetorian and its facehuggers. This is where Johnny and his squad enter and a three-way fight breaks out. A Tarkat and Dino attacks Johnny's squad, killing a generic SF guy with Jax's moves. The Hunter Predator is also killed by the Xenos, leaving only Johnny and the lead Predator to team up to survive. Johnny takes down the Tarkat variant and the Predator kills the Conjurer. The two then blow the lab and hive and Johnny is given a weapon by the surviving Predator, the Brass Knuckles from his Fisticuffs variation. And I'm not really sure where or how, but it would be really cool if we could get Carl Weathers as part of the story, you know, using the Carl Weathers Jack skin to be Carl Weathers reprising the role of Dylan from the first Predator movie, since in this setting resurrection is a thing, so it's not out of the question for a Predator sequel to claim that Dylan got brought back from the dead. And then he and Johnny do the you son of a bitch part, you know, because constant references are expected with Netherrealm guests, right? Wrong. Next, we have Jason vs. Leatherface. We open with Leatherface killing some Task Force members in the woods near his home. Their commander uses a generic SF model and Sony's moveset against Leatherface's butcher variation. Meanwhile, at Camp Crystal Lake, Jason kills a teenager who uses Cassie's moveset against his slasher variation. Eventually, the two killers meet, Leatherface in his Pretty Lady variation and Jason in Relentless. Leatherface kills Jason, but the latter rises again and beats Leatherface in Unstoppable. Then, Cassie enters as the daughter of the murdered commander, whose face is now worn as a mask by Leatherface. She then has to deal with Jason, allowing Leatherface to escape while Jason is knocked into the lake. Cassie's character is determined to finally end her mother's killer in the sequel that we then learn never happened as Cassie had left acting by the time the sequel script was finally finished. Cassie wonders if she made the right choice, leaving the safe and fun world of acting for the military life and worries that she might have disappointed Johnny by following in her mother's footsteps instead of his. Johnny tells her he's proud of her for making that decision herself and for being so brave, and assures her that Sonya is just as proud, even if she doesn't show it. That, or Sonya herself tells her that if she's also there after the events of Chapter 12. And there we have it. We fill in some holes in the narrative, get some continuations for characters who were already in the story, some setup for directions some of these characters could go in MK11, and some nice character moments for the cages. The next of these is Injustice 2, and that's going to be a toughie, I think. We'll see how it goes. The MK11 episode will have to be after all the DLC is done for the game, so don't bother asking about it, bitch. If you liked this video, why not subscribe and support me on Patreon like these fine people here? If not, then make sure to share it with your enemies so they can suffer along with you. Today's recommended video is all 13 Mortal Kombat guest characters ranked by Knickknack Paddywhack. I mean, what's the alternative? That embarrassing Watch Mojo video that ranked Shang Tsung as MK's 9th best guest fighter? Nah, mate.